So this is our final talk. Last but not least, my conference co-host and organizer, David Chindler. Uh, David is a professor of international relations at the Department of Politics here at the University of Westminster. Uh, his research uh, is on issues such as policy interventions, uh, humanitarianism, state building, resilience, uh, and governance. Uh, he's the founding editor of the Journal of Intervention and State Building. Uh, currently, he edits the journal Resilience, International Policies, Practices, uh, and uh, Discourses. Uh, he's a prolific writer. He's published uh, a total of 10 monographs. Uh, the latest ones are forthcoming next year, Onto Politics in the Anthropocene, Mapping, Sensing, and Hacking. Uh, other books are Peace Building, the 20 Years Crisis, 1997 to 2017. The Neoliberal Subject, Resilience, Adaptation and Vulnerability, uh, or Resilience, the Governance of uh, Complexity. Uh, today, uh, David will talk about governmentalities uh, of the digital, mapping, sensing and hacking. So, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm entirely exhausted after a few days of big data capitalism stuff, and I'm guessing that I'm not the only one, but um, so this is it. We reached the end of our weekend. So um, it's been really rich and diverse, and the nature of that is that often the presentations don't speak to each other too much, and we don't necessarily want to do that in a homogenizing way either. But um, I was vaguely, in, not vaguely, I was sort of quite inspired when Antoinette Rouvroy was uh, talking about algorithmic governmentalities. And my presentation is sort of along those lines in terms of governmentalities. And I know that Antoinette has to go in about 25 minutes. So I thought I would slightly engage with her project or my limited ability to read that project. And one of the questions that came up from that earlier session was about people often say that the data is not the world. And I guess, what do we mean by that? Or what are the different things that we mean when we say the data is not the world? And I wanted to sort of talk about that in relationship to the, we've done a lot of capitalism, but not so much necessarily on the governmentalities, the logic of the big data capitalism thing. And when me and Christian were thinking about the conference, we wanted to make it broad, but also sexy. And we're thinking, what's, you know, what words critique capitalism and stuff? And then we sort of thought, what about big data capitalism? So we looked it up on Google. No one had ever said the word big data capitalism in that order before. But over the months, it's become real, like all the other things. That's the wonderful thing, I guess, about academia, that um, things come into the world and they emerge. So I wanted to say something about what I've been thinking about, the problems of the big data capitalism, and how that relates to the data world problematic. And in one of the responses to Antoinette's presentation, it was this, this gap between data and the world seems really difficult to put our fingers on. And when we're sort of arguing, if we are arguing, that there's something new emerging, that this big data is creating something different, but it's difficult to put our fingers on that thing that's different. And the world is obviously the same in that sense. What can be so different about big data? What is big data doing? And I want to argue that there's a traditional way of saying the data is not the world, which is fine in its, in its own wonderful way. And there's another way that sort of says, big data is not the world, but, but more like not the world as we knew it. That in fact, big data is not in the world. Big data is undermining the world as we knew it and instauring, constituting a different world. But it's it looks the same, and so it's really sort of complicated. Um, because it's, it's that complicated, or it seems to me at this moment in time, thinking about it, that there would be no point reading it. As if I'd written it, there'd be no point reading it like that. I have to sort of uh, 
think it myself in a way that I can talk to you. Anyway, so I want to argue that the data is not the world, but another world, a world that's not this world. And that world, one way of understanding that world is that there's something virtual. It's less actual. When Antoinette's saying that it's not the facts, it's not data about facts and knowledge as we knew it. Something else is going on. There's some sort of meaning being generated, but not, not the meaning that we used to know and love. Something is being constituted, some way of governing, engaging, seeing, thinking, but works at a different level. And I sort of want to crudely sort of say the big data machine and the problem with big data capitalism is it takes away the world of the actual, the world of representation, the world of entities, cuts, binaries, causation, the world that had facts, that had knowledge, causation, and brings in another world. And that's when I sort of quizzed Antoinette on the difference between a sign and a signal. I asked her that because I was thinking that at the time. I want to say this world isn't a world of representation. It's, it's immune to being represented and known. It's immune to a discussion along those lines. And so I want to sort of say the new world is coming in. That new world is, can be approached by thinking in terms of the virtual, whatever that might mean, as opposed to the actual, the world that we used to love. And I want to try out an argument about how that mechanism works. What is the machinic, non-human, human data, affects, thinking uh, machine? How does it work? And um, I want to argue that the big data people are not lying when they say it's got something to do with correlation. Correlation, not causation. So at some point in my speech, when I remember, I want to sort of really focus on what we mean by correlations and how correlations might work, particularly in inducing a virtual world rather than an actual one. I've never tried it before, so I'm not guaranteeing anything. So, in the order that I said I was going to do stuff, the first way of thinking about the data is not the world, I would argue is a world where data is actual, where data is about facts, causation, prediction. It sort of has a, a modernist time-space way of plotting data points and extrapolating. And I'm guessing that whether we're trained in Foucauldianism or other critical approaches, we're sort of aware of how to do the data is not the world. Because it sort of says it, it's not rocket science, because it says it already, that data is an abstraction of points. And from those points, we're going to generalize, we're going to abstract. Modern thought is about abstraction, about representation. It sort of says already it's not the world. It's not rocket science, as I said. And the moderns thought they were being clever, because they thought the world was fairly inaccessible. Too much stuff going in, going on, always, all the time. And actually, we, we needed data to be not the world. Meaning, we had to make the world meaningful. We had to artificially construct a human world. And maybe the Enlightenment modernist project was creating a world that wasn't the world. Hundreds of years later, that world doesn't seem good enough for us anymore. And I would argue that what we call the world is the world of the actual, the world that the moderns constructed, the world of meaning, the world for us as humans, the world of subjects and objects, the world of all those binaries, of distinctions between things, the world of distinction. So, and in that world, there was data that wasn't the world. So I want to say some other stuff about this other data that's not the world. But just to make it clear, and maybe to have a discussion with Antoinette, is that towards the end of Antoinette's presentation when she was doing critique, she was saying that the data is not the world. What was the data? What was her example? It was the employers collecting histories, informations to make judgments about who was the most suitable employee. Whether it was going through their social media, looking at their histories, which schools they went to, all the rest of it. 
We know that that data is not the world. We know that that set of abstractions is problematic in many different ways. Not only because it doesn't necessarily tell the truth if there was a truth, but even if there was a truth in the world, it would have been a world full of inequalities, hierarchies, and exclusions. I think it's a wonderful, I would not disagree with the critique that says that's problematic, that you're reifying and essentializing a contingent world and you're taking on board those inequalities and making it into an objective science that can't be criticized and challenged. That if you thought the data was the world when you were doing that, you'd be committing a crime, an error, it should be challenged. So that would, to my mind, is a critique of modernist data, modernist facts, modernist predictions, and modernist extrapolations. I want to suggest that it's No. <laughs> Thank you. So, I want to suggest that good at that, as that critique is, there's other things as well. And that if big data isn't about facts, if big data capitalism is about the signals rather than the representational signs through which we build up the world of knowing and judging and predicting and making decisions through all those cuts, we need another type of critique. Or just to think about how it works before we do critique. I know we're super critical, but sometimes thinking is also okay, I think. So, it doesn't always work, it's not, it doesn't, it's not always successful. So I've tried to sort of say that the world, when we say the world is the world of the actual, big data, capitalism, is bringing a different world. So, those are just assertions. So when I get to the mechanism, that's gonna be more testing for me, and my argument will stand or fail, on actually doing that, so fingers crossed. So, the big data people say, we can't work on causation. Causation is the old data is the world, it assumes that things are fixed and linear, that we can just make a cut and say, this thing will lead to that thing like that without thinking about change, complexity, interrelations, fluidity, those things, the world is dead. The post-structuralist critique of that is that, yeah, the world isn't actually dead, thank God, because the possibilities of us and change and everything couldn't exist in that world. And so, the, the world of causation was always fictional. Fair enough. Anyway, the big data people say that, yeah, of course, you know, we live in the same world as you, but correlation really works. Now, what do they mean when they make that shift from causation to correlation? My argument is that there's two types of correlation. One type of correlation is old-fashioned and works in the actual, and the other type of correlation expands the world of the virtual. Okay, and um, the way it goes is like that, uh, like this. So, correlations, i.e. things coming together that are separate, but nevertheless reflect something else, that enable us to see things, through correlations, if they are correct correlations, we can see something we couldn't see. Correlations are not knowledge. They're not causalities. We're not knowing it more, but we're seeing it. This morning, even though I was feeling a bit rough after last night, I thought I'd do some work on correlation. And what I looked up was how do compasses work and thermometers? Because in my mind, I thought those were correlational mechanisms for seeing. This is an important step of the argument, but I only really did the research today. So help me out in the audience if it doesn't work. What is a thermometer? A thermometer is correlated to outside temperatures. We can see the temperature because of a little machine called a thermometer. You can make thermometers out of different things, water, alcohol, mercury is the main thing. Now, a lot of work went into thinking about the properties of mercury how mercury rises with temperature changes, and then how to, make, to metricate that to do a correlation with outside temperatures. So the work on seeing temperature depended upon separate work on the nature of mercury, metrification, Fahrenheit was quite important, but I guess, no, I don't guess centigrade was someone's name. I'm pretty sure Fahrenheit was the name of someone who thought of that metric. Now that's seeing through correlation and we know about it because it's in the, in the actual world. Compasses are the same thing. 
When we hold them in our hand, they're seen through correlation because there's a thing called magnetic north, but there's also a property called a magnet or a lodestone where when we, I'm not a scientist, we rub the, the magnet lodestone onto the pin, the pin is going to swing around in the cork or something and point to magnetic north. So it's another correlational mechanism. We're finding, a bit like a smartphone in a way, we're finding our direction through a correlational thing. Now, the thing about those correlations is they're actual, they're fixed. Mercury is always going to rise under a certain temperature. It's quite easy to do correlations in the actual world. The lodestone magnet correlation is more difficult because magnetic north changes every year. And in the thing I was reading, it was only Wikipedia, it might not be right, sometimes it's the magnetic south instead of the north. But the point is that even though its fixedness is variable, we understand how it varies. Now, those we can see the magic of those correlations, the magic of the compass, the magic of the thermometer, and that's just working on fixed correlations. We make the thermometer and the compass, we can take it anywhere in the world because it's in the actual, the world of the actual, the world of representation. Now, I want to say, so we, so we see how magic that was. Imagine that there was another machine for making correlational ways of seeing that works in a virtual world. What does that mean? It means in a world where the correlation is not fixed. The correlation is always moving in the same way as the world is moving. Sounds difficult? That's where big data capitalism and algorithms come in. I want to argue that the secret of the source of big data capitalism, the thing that Antoinette was talking about, which I'm probably going to have to, if I look at my notes, I then have to put my glasses on. It takes me about half an hour, but I'm going to do it really quickly because Antoinette said it in a wonderful way. If I can find it, I'm sure I wrote it down. Antoinette says that where the field that's targeted by big data is the irreducible excess of uncertainty over calculation. I think that's 100% right. And the best thing about that for capitalism, that's a big field. That's the field of everything apart from the things that are open to fixed calculations, which, as we know, is very little. So something important could happen if we could do variable correlations that changed all the time and opened up that sphere of knowing the things that we could never know, the whole new world. I want to suggest that whole new world is the thing that we used to call the virtual, the thing where everything happened all the time at once in superposition, not the world that was flat in time and space of modernity. So how does it work? What is this secret machine that lets us step over to the other side, to the side of the virtual, to, to end the world or to enable us to end the world that we knew it? to think in a different epistemological framework where the knowledge and the meaning could never be the old knowledge and meaning, because there could never be a return to entities, representation, causality, and the actual. And we, we cry out to enter that world. So, next step in the argument is this machinic thing. And this is where I think social media is important. So we've had a lot of discussion of social media in the actual world, how we use it, we share data, uh, we do it f in our free time, outside the wage labor relationship of exploitation. We don't need to, it's all important, discussing that, uh, and different labor theories of value, if that could be possible. Um, that's all important, but I want to argue social media is important in the same way as discovering the properties of the magnet, or the same way as discovering how mercury works. It doesn't work literally, it works to make the mechanism to enable us to see. That's why I want to suggest that the governmentality, or a key governmentality of big data capitalism, is sensing. The post-human sensorial assemblage. Um, I'll get on to that in a second. How does it work? So, one second. How do we see through social media? We see through social media because the words that we put into our tweets, into our Facebook, into our SMS texts can be correlated to other things. The algorithms do the correlation work to the other thing. So stuff we all know about, uh, Google's flu trends thing. 
Google don't say they're predicting in the actual world of facts flu. What they say is that they can see flu quicker. How do they see flu quicker? By the efficiency of a correlation between certain words put into Google and outbreaks of flu. You know, cough, sore throat, cold, blah, blah, blah. Google says, we can see flu in its emergence from the first little bit before the person even thought they had flu, because you just have a bit of a cough or a sore throat, to a population spread, all the rest of it. But we see it like in real time. How do we see it in real time? We see it in real time because of the correlation between those words and flu. Now, as probably most people know, they tried it out, it didn't really work very well. Next, you know, they didn't really predict that they're not really predicting. And as Antoinette says, it's not because the facts were wrong. What was wrong was the correlation. Because even when we're doing correlations in the virtual, uh, because it's fluid, they continually have to be changed. The correlations continually have to be worked on. So we know that when, in the imaginary, when someone is working in a particular part of a country, or a, the searches are going to be different in terms of the correlation for flu. So the business of making that correlation in order to see in real time is the business of the expansion of big data capitalism. And in the, in the end, everything will need its own correlational mechanism. That's in terms of the rooms for expenditure. Anyway, so all I'm saying is that the, the money that's made through the social media is not just in terms of social media itself and us taking selfies and commenting and liking. It's also the ability to see other things through it. So flu was one example. Etienne was doing lots of work around flooding. It's sort of the same thing. If we saw the social media work of algorithms to do correlation, it's a bit like using a thermometer or a compass to see things. The most amazing ability to see through correlation. And so not only can we see flooding, if enough people are putting their geo-stamped photos of floods, heights, all the rest of it, if we did that, flooding would be less of a problem because we worked in the virtual to see in real time the flows, the rhythms of the flooding, which is quite arbitrary in a city like Jakarta. It's not like the flooding always happens in one place. It could be anywhere. But the, the problems are ameliorated by the ability to see it as soon as the first crack appears. Imagine the autonomy of the self, you know, the ability to sense together as a collectivity means that problems take on a different nature. Why is that? Because we're moving into a world of indistinction. There's not no flooding and flooding, as I hope Etienne might support me, in the same way as the map of Jakarta yesterday, of the river, was the map of Jakarta. Those blue spots were everywhere. There's equally no division between flooding and not flooding, because you have that much water in the ground, in the river, in the sea. There's going to be water. The, the division between ground and water, flooding, non-flooding, once we start working in the virtual, once we start working through correlations, those distinctions are meaningless. But the meaning, we derive the meaning from the process of indistinctioning. Uh, it sounds wacky, but I'm, I'm over convinced that this has to be entirely correct. So to give you one more example of the indistinctioning of the world, the shift to the virtual through the correlationism stuff, I work in international relations. It's not normally relevant for discussions of philosophy and politics and media. But in one particular case where we use big data in terms of conflict responses, is this idea of Ushahidi and other people that we can see conflict in its emergence through SMS texting. If we, could, if we had the ability to see texts, and if those texts said something like, I'm worried about those people crossing the border, stealing our land, putting up taxes, whatever the conflict mechanism was, if we could see it in a correlational sensing way, in its emergence, we could act responsively to it. We could be sensing, responding, adapting. That's the idea. Whether it's by sending another text saying, don't worry, it's like uh, just rumors, or sending a policeman to lock someone up for being uncivil, 
whatever the response is. The idea is that we're seeing it. Now, in my discipline of international relations, that pretty much transforms everything. How does it do that? Because before, we worked on modernist binaries of entities. We had peace, conflict, response to conflict. A million people had to die before there was a conflict. And after the conflict, the idea was there'd be peace. And before it, there was peace. The world of dis politics and IR is so full of distinctions. Wherever you look, there's binaries, there's distinctions. The world of big data capitalism says, that world is rubbish. We can't even do policy making on that basis, which is why we don't do that anymore. So, say we lived in a world where everyone was able to text or there was other ways of developing the correlations of sensing which are in the virtual. They're in the virtual because the world of the actual does not exist. In this world, the imaginary that I'm telling you, there's no division between peace and conflict, just like there's no division between flooding and not flooding. Why is there no division? Because our attempt to prevent conflict in the future or the uselessness of responding after the conflict is over in some way, that's, it's ridiculous. But if we see it as there's always going to be conflict in the world, in the world of indistinction, there's never peace conflict. People are always arguing, disagree disagreeing, gossiping, challenging, contesting. You know, we all know this to be true. So in that world where we don't have a fantasy of a distinction between peace and conflict, where conflict is everywhere, it can be modulated, it can be managed by seeing through correlation and responding to it. If that was to happen, the, the business of creating indistinction is actually making sense. When we say that the world of big data capitalism is reinstating, initiating a world of the virtual and destroying the world of the actual, we can begin to see it in real life, in real examples of algorithmic governance. How do we govern in the, the world of the virtual? We do it through sensing. And in that world of sensing, in that world where the dynamic is that of making indistinctions, the way that that would work is that we'd never have international relations anymore because one of our biggest problems was thinking about peace. In this world, it's not even a question. There's no such thing as peace conflicts. People would look at you like being an idiot, you know, like flooding, not flooding. Or if we apply big data to health, in the modern world of the actual, in the world of representation, it's like health and sick. Doesn't make sense. The world of the actual is so ridiculous. And we know the world of the actual to be lying to us all the time. There's no such thing as health and sickness. There's all sorts of stuff going on at the same time, i.e. what we call the virtual, Big data helps us respond to it because the data things, they're not facts, they're not knowledge, and they're definitely not signs, they're not words that literally represent something, they're signals. So in the quantified self, big data, self-medication world, your temperature changes, you swear, you're sleeping one minute less than you slept the day before, you're gonna take responsive action. As Antoinette was hinting, you don't even have the opportunity to know what's wrong with you because there's no such thing as things being wrong with you. It's too many distinctions. You can imagine the distinctions fall away the more that we correlate. And the more that we correlate, the more that we have to correlate more. The world of the virtual expands and expands and expands. And we, we need it to because the one thing that we know is that the world of the actual has failed us. The world of representation, the world of causation. Now, my view is, if I'm vaguely right in my understanding of how big data capitalism might work, uh, i.e. through correlation in the virtual, what would the critique be? The critique isn't that the data is not the world, like, because the world is not the world. And, and contemporary theorists do that all the time, after the end of the world. We know that that world was the fiction. Now, the big data capitalist world I wish it was a fiction. Unfortunately, it's all too real. The descent into the virtual, the clamor for indistinction. We've heard it today in most of our presentations. The Italian autonomous school, indistinction leads to autonomy, it, or indistinction leads to equality. Well, actually, you need distinctions. You need to be autonomous from something. 
Uh, equality also needs distinction. Something has to be equal to something. The world of indistinction, the end of that world of the actual, is not, is not a wonderful thing. Surprise, surprise, I'm an academic. The end of the world of meaning, the end of the world of knowledge, oh, you, you don't need any academics anymore. It's the world of sense and response. It's a world, in fact, with, with literally without the world, a world where nothing can ever happen. You know when they say that already, everything's already in, we're always in the middle of stuff. In big data capitalism, it's true. Because there's no, those things can't exist in the world of the virtual. They're already here. There's all sorts of microbes and diseases and changes and fluctuations. The more we live on the world of correlation, of responsivity, there's no room for a rational subject. The world of da big data capitalism, there's no digital subjects and there's no digital objects because only the world of modernity can carve out those distinctions. So, that's, I was going to talk about mapping and sensing and hacking, but um, I thought I'd just talk about sensing because that's really where the virtual comes into being. After that, of course, when we just live in the virtual, we don't think about sensing like that. We think more about our open, in, autonomous engagement, recompositioning, re, uh, you know, reassembling, the world is our oyster and we're, we're not separated from it. The continual flux, the unfolding of the Anthropocene, however we see it, we're, we're in it. At the moment, the big data capitalist world is still pre-eventing, it's stopping. It's still got the negative hangovers of modernity. But anyway, I think it's really important to, to think about correlation, that's all I wanted to say. Correlation in the virtual, that's my hunch that that's, that's crucial for big data capitalism. Um, thank, thank you.